everybody and a very very warm welcome to Borough Talks which is Borough Markets events and podcast series and um, I'm Angela Clutton I am the host of Borough Talks also a cook and a food writer and host of Borough Market Cookbook Club too. Um, I am really really looking forward to today's discussion which is all about the meat non-meat complexities really um, and so many interesting avenues of conversation for us to go down there. Before we invite on Tom Hunt and Yann McCourt who are going to be um, talking with us today, just a little bit of housekeeping although we're so Zoom savvy everybody by now I think it's barely needed, um, please do use the Q&A function on Zoom if you would like to ask a question of our um, panel, our two wonderful contributors. We will probably get to questions at the end but feel free to pop questions in as we go along um, and also do let us know if you're having trouble seeing or hearing anything as we go through because um, there may be maybe technical issue we can fix. Um, we are recording this session and it will um, become the uh, podcast for Borough Market um, but for now this is the Zoom event and uh, we have as I say uh, Tom Hunt joining us who is a chef and climate change campaigner and also Jan McCourt of Northfield Farm who has been trading at Borough Market uh, for more than 21 years so I feel we should say hello to Tom and to Jan. Guys reveal yourselves. Hi Tom. Hi yeah how are you doing? Hello. So yeah uh, so Tom's on a very sort of beautifully sun-kissed balcony looking like he's slightly on hold but I suspect you're not. Um, and Jan, you're you're in a very dark office. This is this is the Zoom the Zoom world. And um, I'm just going to do some quick intros before we get stuck into it properly. Um, Tom Hunt, award-winning chef, writer, climate change campaigner, and author of a cookbook, Eating for Pleasure. We're going to Eating for Pleasure, People and Planet, and we're going to be talking lots about this as we go along. Tom writes a weekly recipe column for the Guardian. Works closely with various charities, including Fair Trade and the Soil Association. Is a signatory and podcast host for the Chef's Manifesto, which is the United Nations initiative that calls on chefs around the world to champion climate-friendly cuisine in their kitchens. Wonderful to have you with us, Tom, for this. Um, Jan McCourt, who runs Northfield Farm with his sons, Dom and Leo. Um, been trading at Borough Market, as I say, uh, for quite a while. In fact, since its rebirth as a public market in 1998, um, Northfield Farm selling traditional and rare breed meat Really using regenerative, sustainable farming methods. We're going to be talking an awful lot about those words as we go through. Um, uh, with meat from his own farm in the Rutland Leicestershire border, and also from other trusted, like-minded producers too. Um, there's a lot. Every time I've said to people that we're doing this today, there's been a raised eyebrows, slight chuckles, sort of um, gasps of, "Oh my goodness, you're going to try and get through all that in about an hour." And we are. We're going to try and do. 45 minutes or so with us with 15 minutes or so of questions and we're going to really try and focus mainly I think guys on three areas I think it's going to be thinking about the health impacts for us and on you know, the dietary choices we make about meat non-meat vegan the rest of it thinking about welfare concerns and the environmental which is really where it feels a lot of this conversation is sort of putting itself at the moment but before we get into all that we're going to kick off with the environmental for anyone who's uh, interested I just thought it might be interesting to ask each of you to take a minute or so to sort of set out your stall really for anyone you know who, who, who would just like to just get a little snapshot of where you arrive at this debate in your thinking yeah I'm going to come to you first for that if that's okay um <clears throat> yes thank you hello everybody um where do I arrive at? I try and arrive everywhere with a very open mind. Um, I think uh, extremism in all forms, whether it's dietary or political or any other um, use of that, that word is, uh, is dangerous. Um, when I was invited to do this, first thing I went out and did, uh, well, not physically, uh, but it was by Tom's book. Um, because I didn't know whether I was being lured into a um, bear trap of some kind, um, because unfortunately, as, as you've hinted at Angela, that this debate, this discussion does polarize people uh, massively. The fact that it polarizes people is probably a good thing. You know, it's good for people to get exercised to a point on certain points, be they, you know, of principle, of taste, of, of, of science. Um, so I think, I think 
an open mind is probably the, the without talking for the rest of your hour, uh, which I could happily do, as you know, <laughs> probably the, the best uh, way to uh, answer your. Yeah. And I have to say, Jan, I think I do feel that's uh, the perfect answer. Um, but Tom, let's, uh, I mean, your book's already getting a lot of nice, getting a lot of nice, lo nice love already. Um, but for anyone who may not be familiar from that with, with, with your take on all this, just give us a little, a little insight. Um, well, I'm an advocate of certainly a plant rich diet and see that as a kind of the way we need to go. Um, but that's with the caveat of it being a whole food plant-based diet or plant-rich diet. Because when it comes down to it, I think if you had to choose between the two, whole foods and lesser processed foods is probably the most important factor because that tends to push us towards what you were mentioning earlier, more regenerative farming and away from the kind of more industrial, industrialized food system. So <clears throat> it's, yeah, I'm kind of, but I'm also kind of would say I, uh, I, I am of an open mind. I've farmed animals myself. I worked at River Cottage back in the day where I did a lot of butchery, excuse the alarm. Uh, and <clears throat> so I've kind of experienced all sides of, of the food industry. Uh, I guess I should, I don't want to ramble on too long, but... Um, Do you eat meat, Tom? I'm vegetarian, but a slightly bad one. <laughs> so <laughs> I break... Mean? I, it means I'll break my vegetarianism on very few occasions okay. if I feel like it, I should. Right, okay. Which you could argue, you know, I should call myself a flexitarian, but I'd say that I, partly the reason I label myself as a vegetarian is to keep myself in check, because... Mm -hmm four years ago when I became vegetarian, I was eating, I was slipping and eating what I would call, you know, bad meat um, or intensively rid meat on occasion, even though I was very much against it. And so for me, it was, it's a very personal thing to, cho to choose how we eat. And I think that should be honored by everyone. And so that's where sometimes the, this debate can go a bit astray because people are very, you know, get very, passionate about it don't they and can actually start to try and impose their views on other people yeah I mean passionate's good but I think it's about trying to listen and hear things I'm just going to pick I'm going to take something that you said then Tom and use that as our beginning point you so you talked about your bad meat in the bird commas and then went on to say industrialized meat just tell us a little bit more what, what do you mean when you say that well in the in the late 90s my first chef and mentor Ben Hodges stood me on the top of a hill in Dorset and asked me what I could see. Quizzically, I answered, beautiful fields, rolling hills, old oak trees. But he replied that these fields are really an industrial landscape. They're not a natural landscape. It's later that same day, we were driving through the countryside and he smelt some manure and he was like, you know, actually, he said to him, this wasn't just the smell of the countryside, this was a smell of intensive farming. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I believe there's some truth and, and some, it's quite really an eye-opening way to look at the countryside because we think, you know, when we leave, I'm in the city now on a rooftop, there's a few trees, but when we go into the countryside, we think, wow, we're in nature. And we are, you know, we're always in nature, whether we're in a city or, or in, in the countryside. But the fact is, especially in Britain, most of the countryside has been industrialized into our kind of modern farming systems. And so <clears throat> that leads to kind of, yeah, thoughts on, you know, what is good and bad animal agriculture? What, I mean, when I worked on a pig farm when I was 14, I was working on what I would call <laughs> an intensive pig farm, even though it was very small, very, very small family farm. There was about five sheds with a thousand or more pigs in, all on concrete, basically. And it's, you know, that is what I consider kind of not good for both, well, for all of these factors that we want to discuss yeah. today, whether it's animal welfare or, you know, the quality and health benefits of that meat. 
and the implications for the environment. Yeah. So and when we're talking about food sustainability, you know, we really have to think about all of these different factors at the same time. Yeah. And, and often they'll come with ca cachets where you one will get better, but the other might drop. So. Yeah, there's so often a sort of you know, perception that you know, meat production equals bad for the environment. And what Tom's just been you know, beginning to kind of get into, and obviously as you're a farmer, you really want to kind of you know, hit, hit some, you know, maybe some of the, the detail of it from you in terms of what sort of you know, good farming is and bad farming. It's, it's awkward putting these labels upon things, but maybe these labels are deserved. But I'd like to probe into that with you a little bit more, Jan, about sort of this notion of you know, bad farming and maybe we can begin to think about it, you know, industrialised farming. And is that what we mean when we talk about meat production being bad for the environment? I think um, going back to, to Tom's image of standing on the hill, I think um, reading the, uh, what you see when you look out on a countryside landscape is a bit like um, learning a language. Um, you can, uh, if, if you're a, a beginner in that language, you can look at a green field and think it looks wonderful, which I think is kind of what Tom was, was um, saying. Um, you can look at a field that is more of a patchwork, might be smaller, has got rough hedges, perhaps untrimmed hedges, has some nettles and some thistles and some uh, goodness knows what growing in it, and actually think the reverse. Whereas environmentally, um, and in one definition of sustainably, you would be thinking exactly the reverse of, of reality. In other words, you would be making the same misunderstanding um, that you might make if, some, if you thought that someone had offered you a, a present, but they'd offered you a bomb um, in a different language. Uh, not that that's ever happened to me, but um, it's, it is a language of, it, of its own. Um, and the use of simple words like good and bad are, to oversimplify, frankly, um, it is, uh, as we'll see, it will be impossible to cover all of this in detail in, in 45 odd minutes, but it's brilliant to be trying. Um, when I looked at, I mean, I'm not here particularly to, to plug Tom's book, but when I looked through it, because I haven't had a chance to read every word, um, I like the way things are set out. And very early on, he's got a section, Know Your Farmer. Um, He's got a section, what was the other one? Choosing sustainable produce, uh, eating whole foods, uh, eat for pleasure. Um, I mean, and then nourishment or what have you. And, 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 so, and it goes on. I, I really couldn't, it's impossible to fault any of those points. And I think particularly that, um, that uh, know your farmer, uh, was it know, yeah, know your farmer. It's, it's thinking and educating oneself about food which, yes, in itself, the time, the ability to do that is in itself a luxury. So food is polarised socially in terms of income, in terms of knowledge. Um, but we have to try, all of us, to do better to both discuss it, but also educate ourselves about it. Um, we mowed our grassland that we've been nurturing for, uh, you know, right through the winter, and right through to last week. Um, for hay and silage. Um, we farm that, in, I would love to farm that in the um, so-called organic, old school, let everything grow, et cetera, et cetera way. But part of sustainability is actually surviving as a business. And there in that, that uh, creates a very difficult ingredient to put in the mix and, and balance out. Um, I can walk across one of our fields as I did before we mowed and lose count of the diversity of different types of plant and grasses that are growing in there. And that captured in a bale of silage will, will um, be beneficial to our animals when we feed them through the winter. Um, I can feed them something that has a lower protein count, is um, much, much more diverse, and it actually won't add the condition that we need to add to produce the product that our punter wants and that our perhaps occasional meat eater might save up for and relish all the more than a bog standard piece of meat that comes from, uh, it's very, very in the news at the moment, a cattle lot in Australia, for example. Yeah, 
I'm curious, uh, interested to try and get into a little bit of the differences between um, animal farming. We're not just going to talk about animal farming, we're going to broaden out, but thinking about um, the environmental impact, the different styles of <clears throat> animal farming. We, we, we keep saying about industrialised. What is it about industrialised meat production which is bad environmentally? Uh, are you asking Tom or me? I, whoever wants to grab it. Um, I think it's like all this, as we said right at the beginning, the definitions are incredibly difficult to pin down. I mean, the latest uh, buzz word in, in farming is regenerative farming. Um, to myself and many others I know, either virtually through, through the internet or, or physically through, through friendships and community, um, look at this label regenerative, which I've chosen to use because it, it is beginning to be understood by, by people, but there is no formal definition of it. Um, and I think it's very difficult to, to formally define. Uh, to regenerate is, to, is, is an element of sustainability. Um, you, there is a sense in which it represents outside versus inside, but certain land can't tolerate um, animals outside all the year round, such as ours. Does that mean we shouldn't be farming livestock? Well, the land that we've got is, is really pretty poor arable land. So uh, we, our farming enterprise, our food production enterprise would not be sustainable if we were to plow it all up. If we were to plow it all up, we would release a massive amount of carbon into the atmosphere. We have entirely old um, pasture land, old grassland, which is, uh, as far as I'm aware, one of the single best ways to sequester carbon and keep it in, in the ground. Um, so one could say a, um, a system that sequesters carbon by growing grass and then transforming that grass into a source of protein, which is uh, among the, the, the best, the most enjoyable to take up one of, a, one of Tom's earlier chapters about pleasure um, is, is surely a, a positive thing, a good thing. Um, to take something where you have a barren piece of ground where there's no sequestration, sequestration of carbon, where there's an incredibly dense, intense um, uh, group of, of animals being finished on, um, on a commercial grain mix, for example, that is going to do very little of those things. I think in, in general terms, that is viable. In general terms, that is understandable. But then how do you feed the world? So these topics are so huge and I did manage to, to spend a bit of time looking at some, trying to look up some of the statistics and the graphs that get thrown around on this subject. And actually just like too much in this sort of post-truth COVID world, what is the truth about stuff? And, and that, is, that is one of the huge, huge barriers to understanding. And I certainly struggle with it. Yeah. Um, Tom, I've been reading, um quite a lot about how land is being uh, used to just grow the grain that can be used to feed animals which aren't grass-fed and so you're not you know, the wonderful you know, grass-fed cattle which we all love to you know be able to get excited by but sort of looking at it in the other way how big a problem is that about land just being sort of just turned into soy production and 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 and, and is everything I've just said right you can, and you can yeah. say because I'm not the expert you guys are. Well, I just wanted to agree with Jan that when I used, you know, the word bad, I did use inverted commas because I do also agree that it's oversimplification and um, it's good to get away from that, which of course we're now doing. Um, <clears throat> and also I just wanted to say that, yeah, when I was talking about this kind of idyllic, you know, landscape that Ben was saying is an industrial landscape, I was just, yeah, referring to this, you know, this quintessential idea we've got of the British countryside, especially in places like Dorset, that, you know, is shattered by this idea. Um, but when it comes to grain production, and in particular soy, it's funny because a lot of people use this argument against veganism, like, oh, you're eating soya, you're eating avocados, of course this is crazy, like, it's part of an omnivorous diet anyway, but we're actually globally consuming the majority or 80% of our soy indirectly through 
meat and dairy. So the vast majority of this crop is being fed to animals. And so to slightly disagree with Jan at the end of his point, it, I don't, I, I also, a caveat quickly, I would say it really annoys me when people kind of talk about you know, the whole world going vegan all of a sudden, because of course that's not appropriate, it's not gonna happen. But having said that, although it's good to perhaps rear animals on non-arable or poor arable land, there are obvious arguments for pu a pure, a kind of a pure argument would be, yes, let's rewild that. That's a much better way to sequester and capture carbon. But then also, if we were to turn all of the grain, the arable land that's used for grain to feed animals over to, for human production, we would need much, much less land globally to farm. So that's a really strong argument to, to move towards a plant-rich plant diet um, environmentally. Of course, there's many others. Um. You touched on uh, a leap around slightly because you mentioned avocado. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. This because it's also interconnected anyway. I mean, trying to kind of you know, do things in sections is you know it's also an easy section, obviously. Um, but you said avocados, and that reminded me of something which I wanted to make sure we did talk about. So let's do it now, which is about food miles because yes. it feels like for years food miles have been you know one of the food environmental you. Know, bogeymen and things to be able to really be very worried about that and that seems to be a slightly evolving position Tom. Yeah I mean I think there's so many reasons to support local food so I don't want to sure. bad mouth it it's like actually I believe in local food systems but if you're going to just focus on food miles as your main issue it can actually start to become a way that companies can use to, to greenwash their other externalities and impacts. Because of course, you can have a local farm that is far more harmful to the environment than one. I mean, I think Jay Rayner argued in, in one of his books about importing lamb from New Zealand and how it's kind of better for the environment because, you know, sea freight is relatively low in terms of its carbon emissions. I don't necessarily believe that. Like, I think, you know, when you start to talk about the sort of farming that, that Jan's doing at Northfield Farm, that obviously isn't comparable, it's far better. But um, it's really a case of, I've just blanked, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just right. got distracted. Just, I just got uh, distracted and blank. So um, to come back to, to come back to food miles quickly. Yeah. Um, basically, River, Riverford give a really good example because they have chosen to import food. I think the majority of their vegetables come from their local farms, but they still import from Europe, and they give a really good example of tomatoes. And they say for every kilo of tomatoes grown in the UK hothouse, as in a heated greenhouse, two to three kilos of carbon are released into the atmosphere. But when we grow tomatoes at home without heat, we truck over naturally sun ripened ones from Spain. So that uses a tenth of the carbon because they're sun ripened. Yes, they've been transported by road, but actually that's quite low in terms of its emissions compared to the other externalities involved with that product. But they're actually just to jump in on, on that one in particular, and it's not anti Riverford at all. I think what, what um, uh, guys that has done there is, is superb, it's fantastic. Um, but what is missing throughout the whole of this debate and food and commerce as a whole is proper true cost economics analysis. So, alongside, as, as did appear very early on in, in the nightmare of COVID looking at Spanish tomatoes and Spanish fruit growing in particular, is the, the near um, uh, indentured slavery type conditions that many of the workers in southern Spain growing under a sea of plastic are actually producing um, these otherwise wonderful foods. There's a very similar argument made about mange too from, from Kenya. Um, 
And then, then you get into yet another spiral of the argument that, well, you know, these guys are lucky to have any kind of income. And without, without this kind of approach commercially, they, um, they'd be even worse off. Um, but we saw literally, didn't we? We saw, we saw a film of, of, I don't know whether you did, but I certainly did, of Spanish fruit growers uh, in, in, in shanty towns um, providing the sort of tomatoes, um, I don't know, well, then hopefully not only that, those conditions providing these, these sort of tomatoes, but it is, we keep going back around to the fact that it is incredibly complex and the true cost of all these things um, appears not to be measured anywhere. And I mean, the, the whole rewilding or wilding um, concept in itself is, uh, is overlaced with a romanticism that fails to look at both the science and the reality. So you have rewilding, so-called rewilding projects that, that bring in species from Eastern Europe to aid the rewilding, whereas we have our own native breeds, be it horse, be it cow, be it whatever, that would do a much better job of it if you, if you feel that, that rewilding is, is, uh, is appropriate. The farmland here, when I bought Northfield far too long ago, um, one of the first things I did was I went round with a, a wonderful young lady who was an expert in analyzing the, um, the flora, the, what was growing. And one of the things I was immediately very keen on and, and have continued to be was, is hedges. And she explained to me that many centuries ago, this whole sort of little valley that we run through um, would have been woodland. So, you know, does that mean, and, and now it's, there are lots of woods, but there's these pockets of grass that run through our farm and, and other farms around us. And by valley, valley, it doesn't compare with the Lake District or Wales or whatever. But but by our humble Midland standards, it's a little valley. Um, and so we counted up um, across various parts of the farm the number of spe different species growing in old, clearly old hedge, ancient hedge, um, over a hundred meter um, distance. And each different mature species represents a century. So the agricultural grassing down if you like of this area which is north of farm took place about seven or eight hundred years ago um do we look back on that and we like do should we be likening that to the stripping out of the amazon forest the amazon rainforest should we be looking at it as now a very traditional um uh, almost tribal method of survival and farming and community that deserves to be protected in its own right I'm sure there'd be different people, probably among the hopefully millions that are watching this, that would uh, take e either either view. It's a it's a very very difficult one as we keep going back to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's okay to keep admitting that it is. You know, mm. this is all complicated and there aren't absolute answers. Um, I can't tell you how much I wish we were doing it live and that everyone could really sort of see the range of Tom's uh, expressions as you know, just listening to you. And then I feel like you want to kind of you know, come in and weigh in on some of that. Do you want to just give a quick? Oh, please do. Oh, sorry. Can you lead with a question, please? Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry. No. I was. Uh, well, no. Let's let's move. Um. Because I do actually want to take the conversation in a slightly different way and think about, uh, think about the welfare things. And you know, Jan, you were just talking about the, the length of time that you've, um, been in, in Northfield Farm, and I wonder to what degree you feel that over the, over that span of time, the conversations around people's concerns about meat have evolved. And it seems to me it used to be very much about animal welfare. And now that's much less of a concern against all the environmental things that we've just been talking about. And if that's right, how much of an issue is animal welfare still for people who are concerned or, or, or celebratory of meat? Well, when, when I started Northfield as a, as a business, it had been a, a home, family home for a few years. And then um, through a combination of events, I found myself out on my ass, so to speak, from a, a career in the city. And I made a conscious decision to not try and go back into that life and to open a tiny little farm shop, learn how to butcher up an animal, bring in, you know, and, and do what I've done over the last 24 years or, or whatever it is. And I sat down and I thought, how, what is the message I most want to put across? What is going to carry this forward because I want to do things differently. And I wrote down 
a number of words and I came up, I wrote down, it, at the end I, I chose one word and that word was responsibility. And I guess I've got it somewhere in my you know, horrendous mess of an office, which is one of the reasons it's so dark behind me. Um, I, I wrote a piece, uh, a, a piece of sort of uh, an address, if you like, to our would-be customers. And it was an entreaty to take responsibility. And I think if you start by taking, and I can see some of the, the threads that are coming on in the, in the chat section, um, and it's something that people have said a lot to me, and, and in essence, it's exactly what Tom is saying in here, is look at what you put into yourself. Um, it, you there's nothing else that we do in life that is more important than how we feed ourselves nutritionally, health-wise, in terms of pleasure and mental health, physical health, all, all the rest of it. And yet, by and large, especially then, because I think I was slightly ahead of the, the, the herd, especially then, people simply weren't considering it. Of course, many were, but as a whole. And if you take that as the starting point, and if you, I, I wrote another thing years ago, which was called the rule of least remove. If you try and shorten that distance between what you buy to eat and who produces it, as few steps as possible, combine that with, I think, without putting words into Tom's mouth, the, the whole uh, science and, um, and learning about ultra processed foods, simplify it down, you will end up with a healthier, more um, constructive, more sustainable approach to food. Tom, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think what Jan's getting at and what I think is a uh, it's something that I, a realization I've come to through ruminating on these issues is that you know food is nature ingested. We are we are nature, and that's one of our key connections. Food is one of our key connections. And so the more we can learn about where our food comes from and connect and know our farmers and get involved with our food, even if it's just cooking, the, the, the more we're going to achieve in terms of our own well-being and personal health, but also kind of really globally, because it's such an interconnected community that starts around our table starts with our family around our dinner table and echoes out through our farmers and through the land and that of course is part of a truly global network now in today's world even if you're a, a locavore if you want to call it that as I am or as our restaurant Poco is and we you know favor fresh fruit and vegetables from within 50 to 80 miles or at least the UK um, <clears throat> you know we're, we're still part of this global food network and we have been for so many years i mean we've been importing spices around the world and and all these different ingredients for so long and so just to completely ignore them is, is yeah it's not necessarily right but yeah really it's what i'm trying to get at is the, just this idea of conscious eating not in a you know uh overly hippie sense just in a, in a true sense of like wanting to kind of be responsible as Jan was saying. And I feel that you're both talking and feeling a lot about knowing and understanding what it is that you're choosing to buy, cook, eat and choosing to be responsible, choosing to be informed and have an understanding. Um, and I just want Tom to get your um, view on some of the meat, you know, fake meat uh, you know, substitutes that have become, certainly seem to be a lot of them around, you know, at the moment, whether they, you know, they're you know, popular, I have to say, I've never had like a fake burger or you know, whatever, but um, I'd love to get you, I'm sure that's, this is a very, very nuanced area as well, but I'd love to kind of, you know, get your take on the, the, the fake meat, meat substitute stuff. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's going back to this idea of industrial agriculture and agroecological farming or regenerative farming, whatever you want to call it, and or processed food and whole food. And it's the same thing, no matter what we're eating, really. And, and so when it comes to plant-based alternatives, 
depending on the level of processing. They can be good or bad for you and the environment. It's not black or white. Some things can be heavily processed and still generally okay for you. But as a rule of thumb, uh, a whole food is gonna be better for you. So uh, obviously we're seeing this kind of plant-based revolution of things like you know, lab meat being more produced and hope, well, not hopefully, but <laughs> at some point that's gonna go onto the shelves, I imagine. Um, but then, you know, we're at the stage where we've got these um, heavily processed alternatives such as the Beyond Burger and things like that. And, you know, as someone who sees the in, kind of industrialization of, of our food system as, as one of the major issues and one of the main current ish issues of the obesity epidemic, I can't really see it as a, as a solution. So a Beyond Burger, I think has, I'm sure intentionally quite uh, equal nutritional value to a burger that might be overly fatty and not really kind of good nutritionally. Um, I think all of these things is fine as a treat, but I d so I'm, I, I tend to try and avoid them. I still enjoy them myself. If I sometimes they're as a, you know, trying to hold to my vegetarianism, I might even choose to have um, a Beyond Burger or something like that, because, you know, I think it's really important that we're not, uh, per we, you know, it's impossible to be perfect. It's good to have this good baseline of, of eating well, but I'll tend to steer much more towards tofu and tempeh and jackfruit and seitan and these kind of lesser processed foods and of course whenever I can I'll also be buying organic or biodynamic because of the improved farming systems there. Yeah Tom touched on it and we've had a question in um, as well asking about um, lab meat, lab grown, lab cultured, lab produced, whatever the right phrase would be. Um, can you just tell us well, I think it'd be quite interesting to delve into what actually d does that mean and then yeah, and to get your take on it. Well, I'm, I'm definitely not a scientist. Sure. Um, I think I, I would, you know, the, 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 the label Franken Foods came, came in pretty quickly after the concept of lab grown meat or lab repro reproduced or copied meat started to emerge. Um, I think what one has to, in, in, in most of these cases, the old adage of follow the money is is a, a very uh, sound one to, to do and um, to look at the ambitions of a number of very small global players in the food market to create products that that wean consumers away from the reality of food and the simplicity of great food and it was interesting that you know tom talked about having such a thing as a treat. Um, and there, is, there has been a, um, a deep psychological <clears throat> manipulation over many, many years of things that are inherently bad for us, that any one of us, if we sat down and discussed them, be it a, a processed bar of some kind of sweet, be it a, a particular type of burger meal or, or otherwise and yet we are our psyche in most cases and most most strongly um, illustrated by you know love him or loathe him by Jamie Oliver's attempts in in schools we've been we've been brainwashed or many many people millions of people have been brainwashed into thinking of something that is actually inherently bad as occasionally good and I'm not having a go Tom at all you 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 go for it and and I am as, as weak-willed as the next person sometimes in grabbing something off a shelf that I know is terrible and that I know is structured and created to make me, me want more of it. And you then, you then get into the whole um, lean meat versus fat meat, the, the, um, the whole uh, aspect of, of satisfaction, of, of feeling replete. And the fact is that you, the, the more processed the food is, the less replete you feel. And with that comes the desperation for more, the spending of more money unnecessarily, 
and then that in turn leads to illness and and obesity um i i think follow the money follow the even it down to some of the statistics that that, that come out that make an argument against meat eating um and pro non-meat eating and all all the other ends of the the extreme you follow back and you can find as many different statistics as as you want to bolster each end of the argument and that is scary that shouldn't be the case and very often you will in my opinion you will find the money behind some of these um these statistics is very clearly biased in one way or the other yeah um, i think I there's consensus got, there's no, consensus on. by most scientists that we should be eating a predominantly kind of plant based diet in terms of yeah the massively reducing the meat that we eat, especially red meat i mean even the nhs recommend we eat i think it's 70 grams of equivalent of 70 grams of meat a day that's like you know less than half a steak um so there's i think although you know there's you're, you're right there's this kind of craziness of of science and and people can prove anything if they want to and they're and they're clever enough but the reality is the majority of scientists are saying that we should be eating more plants well I, I'm not, you know, like all these things, I, I'm neither a scientist nor a statistician. Um, I don't know where that majority line that you quote uh, lies, um, but I do, from my limited time in researching, look at, I think a lot of the, those sort of messages are backed up by the Eat Lancet report, which came out last year. That's the, one of the most, which is viewed by many people as being totally definitive, but it's one of the most hotly contested areas of recommendation, political influence and business influence that I'm aware of in, in the debate. And I think that is yeah. largely the um, uh, influences the, the NHS guidelines to, to which you refer. I mean, I, I, I'm by no means a, an entire carnivore. Um, I love my vegetables. I, have every, I try and have everything in balance. And I think that's, that's where we are. We have even we don't even know what the definition of, of processed food is in many cases, because similar guidelines that are adopted widely um, look at uh, so-called um, processed meats. Where is the definition of a processed meat? Does that mean we should only be having one rasher of bacon every week? Um, and yet when you look at the research of the diet of the so-called, you know, held, held up to in, in, in glory of Southern, Southern Europe, yes, there's lots of vegetables. Yes, there's lots of of, of um, fresh cheese, very high fat content, et cetera, et cetera, consumption of alcohol and consumption of precisely uh, cured meats at, at a very, very high level. And yet you have in many cases with on those diets, some of the greatest longevity and great and, and, and best health of anyone on the planet. We come yeah, back. I think, there, we come I back think there are still in small quantities comparatively in terms of weight um, and the amount of meat we eat. I mean, you're, the, I think, you know, you've got the five blue zones um, globally, which are where the most centenarians live and are where people are the most healthy, like Okinawa, Japan and Sardinia and all these places. And the, the kind of the key factor really is that these places, although they might be eating some hamon and things like that in Sardinia, is the, the meat consumption of the elderly people is much lower. It's that kind of peasant diet that is majority kind of plant or very plant rich. Um, I read it's um, really interesting. An interesting stat, I thought, um, which was in Carolyn Steele's book. And I don't know what her source was, but I read it in Carolyn Steele's book. And she was saying that 100 years ago, we typically ate on average 25 kilograms of meat a year. That was 100 years ago. And now it's more like 80. Yeah which is a big, which is big. Actually, audience. I've got a similar stat in my, so in my book, I've got, a, although it's kind of plant, mostly pl the recipes are pretty much plant-based, they're flexible, but there's, um, I've got a, uh, yeah, I quote that as well. I say the average UK resident eats about 85 kilos of meat each year, 20% or more that most people will waste, also waste on average 
263 liters of water and in, in, if intensively farmed all of the rainforest and soya and etc cetera, etc cetera. it's interesting that you should kind of pluck that fact because it, it is a huge amount of meat yeah, uh, compared yeah. to what we used to eat although i suspect if i totted up my own i think if i you know i think i'd probably even top that average um just going to come to some questions from our audience and people who want to ask questions, please do. We're going to try and uh, whip through these in the time that we have. Um, if you can make sure to pop it into the Q&A function rather than the chat, if it's in the chat, I may not catch it. So if you have a question for our panel, please pop it into the Q&A. Um, we have an interesting question that came in um, a little while ago. And also there's a lot of love coming in for you guys for the, for the nature of this conversation. So huge thanks for all that we're doing. Um, we have a lady with Jackie who is saying perhaps we need to think more about seasonality why do we think we have the right to eat whatever we fancy whenever we like tom why do we think we have the right to eat whatever we fancy whenever we like because it's laid out in front of us and the same goes for you know we were talking about treats and like having to make these choices every day yan was saying and I, and like we i know i might choose to eat a beyond burger or a real meat burger one day what you know and that's my choice but Wilson goes into this in her last book basically kind of saying actually it's our environment that is the main deciding factor when it comes to the way we eat and if we're surrounded by vegetables from all around the world and we've got this very limited choice of seasonal vegetables it's really really hard to to choose those seasonal vegetables um and yeah i mean it I was thinking earlier a little bit as well about, you know, we're both, we're all living in really kind of quite privileged way, working in food. I mean, Jan's beautiful farm, surrounded by the best meat in the country, and um, you know, me sitting down all day in places like this, writing um, and thinking about food and buying the best food I can because it's everything I'm about. Not everyone has those choices, and so that's a major factor. Um, and it's really important to consider that um, when it comes to, you know, this debate. What is Tom, the accessibility of our food? You have um, gorgeously led us on to what is the next question that's come in. So I'm just going to dive in and just unhead okay. the question because you've, you've, you've brought us beautifully to it. I just say, buy seasonal. No, no. <laughs> buy seasonal. It is I the do, best if you can I'll find it. It's really easy to find in the supermarkets. It's labelled with a fat union jack. because That's fashionable these days. And, uh, or of course, get to a farmer's market, order your veg box and order the seasonal one. It's the best way to start your shopping for the week around this box of beautiful seasonal vegetables. That's gonna lower your impact, improve your health and then allow you to bolt on those treats that we've been talking about, whether that's a mango or a fillet steak. One Although I would always recommend buying an anglet or a shin. One of the things I love most about you know, going to Borough Market through the year is just feeling the way that the seasons, the produce through the seasons changes and you just sort of feel it. It's just, it's sort of a, you know, organic in a, in a slightly more romantic sense of the word feeling. I think if I, if I, I know you want to Go move on. to Go the societal issues, Angela, but I think just picking up on something that, that Tom said, the, the privilege of, of working in food, um, in a, in, I don't disagree with it. Um, we are incredibly privileged, but actually that pinpoints part of the problem. It shouldn't be a privilege. It should be something that is totally normal. And our, our exchange and our relationship with our customers, with our suppliers, with, our, uh, with the society that we create when we are involved in farming and food or cheese making or what, whatever it might be, that is actually normality. That should be normality. It's the growth of, uh, of massive, massive businesses seeing food entirely as a commodity which of course it is in some respects and not touching on any of these these other aspects i don't know whether either of you or any of our our audience have watched um clarkson's farm since it was released earlier this week i made a point of watching it um not not a particular clarkson fan or not not a particular top gear fan but obviously hugely passionate about farming and i really really recommend you watch it there is some serious passion, there's tears, there's some stupid stuff because it's Clarkson. But what comes out of it actually is a really important message to both sides of the argument because you, you get a, uh, an insight into food production, which frankly, as a lot of farming commentators said, 
uh, in, in a series of, of, of eight 45 minute episodes, Country File has failed to do in 25 years. You know, you really see some real stuff. Yes, there's theatrical elements to it. Yes, you know, there's a massive budget, but I really recommend it will bring, even a hardened old sod like me, it, it's, it made me tear up in one or two places. And I think that's really, really important, especially when you're associated with meat. Never ever take for granted that you know, animals' lives are involved in this, but never also take for granted that human lives are involved in this. Many people know that I was nearly wiped out in a tractor accident a number of years ago. You know, it is so dangerous. It is so on the edge. It has so many mental health issues. It has so much loneliness, and yet it can be so productive in terms of a community that we belong to, that we generate, that we su support. And we have customers from Borough that visit the farm regularly. They may have come 20 years ago because they wanted to see whether or not we're actually walking the walk. I, if I'm around, I always take people around to see the cattle, to see the hedges, to do you know whatever it is. That it's it, no one would do what we do, or certainly what Clarkson has spent the last year doing, only to make money. There's no one that makes a a, a, a fake burger um, with you know x hundred ingredients, exaggerating to make a point, other than to make money. I'm um, just going to rattle through, I'm afraid, there's so much on that which we could follow up on, but I'm just aware of wanting to touch on as many points from people as I can. This is quite a technical question, possibly, Jan, so um, maybe if you could be slightly quick on it. Um, or maybe, or, you know, see how you feel. Is there importance in feeding your herd silage that has been grown in the same environment that they live? That is, is there more or less benefit in bringing in rich food for over the winter? Uh, that is an interesting question. It's a little akin to um, trying to eat um, eat honey in that is is produced in the area in which you live, because that is believed to have all sorts of benefits in terms of resistance to uh, disease and hay fever and this and the other. Um, really, the production of silage is a way of maintaining as close a degree of nutrition in the grass through the winter period. Uh, even if we were able, our animals could live outside perfectly happily, but they would damage the grass because we have, we're have we on clay with generally far too much rainfall at the wrong time. Uh, it's not enriched in, in any particular way, although by um, applying a bit of science and experience, you can make good silage or bad silage, but it is really um, the continuation of uh, feeding as much grass in whatever form as one possibly can. The alternative is importing grains, I suppose, which we, we spoke about earlier. Yeah. And also as a kind of lover of fermentation, silage is essentially fermented grass, isn't it? Yeah. And that has myriad benefits for, the, for, the, for any being it's, and it's their gut health. No, that, that's absolutely right. It's also something that broadly speaking, although you can't smell different protein levels and protein improves how quickly an animal uh, finishes for want of a better, for, for, to use the technical term, the smell of fine silage, just like very, very different from the smell of fine hay is a glorious, glorious thing. I'm going to come to what I suspect is our last question, and I'm going to ask you both to answer it from, just dip, from d your different perspectives, really. So, um, Tom, I'd like you to take this question thinking purely about um, fruits and vegetables and, well, non-meat produce, really. Um, we have someone who's saying, a major hurdle in buying organic and sustainable produce is the cost. Any ideas on how to make this produce accessible to a wider group of consumers? Yeah, I mean, that's the basis of my whole book and, and kind of food sustainability philosophy route to fruit eating which is, you know, was born out of the global food waste scandal and it, this term that I coined to communicate ideas of eating the whole ingredient, whether that's an animal, no for tail or a vegetable from root to fruit or, you know, stem to leaf or whatever you want to call it. But it quickly kind of, I quickly realised that, you know, it's, it's not that simple. Why do we care about food being wasted because of all these issues? really food waste is the tip of the iceberg and all of these issues are major factors that we have to consider and that led 
to various other understandings like we need to support biodiversity and, and really this whole manifesto um, which Jan spoke about a bit earlier um, and <clears throat> throughout this whole journey the the kind of two key barriers that people come to me with are time and money and that's the questions you get every time and so those I've I've made root for eating kind of time efficient and as you know, economical as possible because that's how people are going to be able to adopt these better food choices and often these better food choices are about supporting better farming and we can do that very simply by reducing our waste and eating more plants because we're saving money through practicing both of those methods and if you slap whole foods on there and you buy you know whole whether it's soy or even better a local grain from Gilchester's or or bean um, you, you're really creating a very economical diet. Now time, you know, cooking and eating is time well spent, not just for, you know, pleasure and um, hedonistic reasons, but also really obviously for our health. And, um, but you can, you can really cook very quickly with better quality or simple raw ingredients, especially when you're starting to kind of tap into organic produce that just tastes incredible. You can yeah, just yeah. simmer a cabbage and, and dress it with a bit of olive oil and salt and it will taste divine. Um, and so there you go. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm going to come to you for the same question, but from the meat perspective. So major hurdle in buying organic and sustainable produce is cost. Ideas for how to make more accessible to a wider group of consumers. I think um, I, I don't follow the we, we don't farm organically in the soil association sense. We farm with minimal inputs. Um, we farm definitely extensively. I think um, very clearly one of one of the ways to do that is to buy cheaper cuts. Um, years ago, we used to uh, when we first started doing farmers markets, we did farm, a farmers market in Loughborough, and our main customers were busloads of pensioners that used to arrive on a Wednesday. I think it was a Wednesday morning, and their budgets were you know just a few pounds for the week, and we specialised in showing how they could buy. Uh, from us and other um, traders there and and fit within those budgets. So unfortunately, one of the challenges is education. Um, I we have we have a just the most shocking education in food in this country. Uh, I remember when Leo, who those of you that know Borough will will know well, uh, Dom's brother, uh, he, he was passionate about cooking from the beginning and in domestic science or whatever it was called at school, they, they wouldn't cook. They wouldn't actually do anything that really involved kids getting uh, you know, deep down and dirty with ingredients. And he used to, ref and he'd bring in steaks to cook and he'd bring in this, that and the other and cause a ruckus. And, you know, we need to mix it up a bit educationally with our, with our children. But it is also, you know, we need to have a, clearly we need to have a part two or three or four of this debate because your final question touches so importantly on the um, the gulf socially in terms of education and understanding and and budget um, and you can eat well very very cheaply it's just not as easy um, we have a lot of people coming and questioning the subject of organic and most of them if you ask them politely have no idea what organic means and that is sad. That's not knocking organic at all. It's just sad. I, I could go on for... Yeah, well, as you say, there's so much to get into on this, which um, we can't, but I do think I do think you guys have had a fair old crack uh, um, getting through a lot of these um, areas and issues for which I and our audience, I think, are hugely grateful. Um, Tom, your, your book has had a lot of love today, but it is deservedly so because it is a fab book. Um, Northfield Farm, I think, should also get uh, the correct amount of love because it's just the most excitingly glorious butchers. I bought a loin of pork there the other day and it uh, was uh, exactly as fabulous as I knew it would be. Um, and Jan, I think you're now uh, opening the evenings too for people to come and... Yeah, we've, we've joined the um, Borough Market Alfresco movement. 
Um, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we have a wonderful chef um, and from seven o'clock till 10-ish, we're doing uh, a very simple, but very focused menu um, with a lovely, lovely local beers from up here, from, uh, from very close to the farm and a little bit further up at the Welbeck Estate, some great wines. And obviously we'd love you all to join us. It's very much this project, I think it's fair to say is born out of COVID for us and for many others um, and is hugely important. Um, and I'm actually starting to try and come down to borrow a bit more often uh, to try and support that. Um, but thank you. Yes, any opportunity for, for support. Is it Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Anne? Is that right? Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for us. Yeah. Okay. So highly recommend uh, people get down and enjoy some of the Northfield meat at home or indeed at the market. Um, we're done for time. Um, huge thanks again. Tom, do you want to say something? I just wanted to say um, what, what a pleasure especially yeah chatting with you both I mean incredible um, presenting and, and learning more about your your farm I've always been an advocate of your farm and written about it in Borough Market uh, online as well um, but also I wanted to mention I'm going to put my notes up from for this conversation on my website Chef Tom Hunt within the hour yeah so check it out and uh, yeah please stay in touch. That is absolutely brilliant. And this event, uh, which has been recorded, will become part of the Borough Talks podcast. So if anyone wants to watch back and wants to let people know, it'll be there, um, not immediately, but you know, in, in a little while. Um, huge thanks, Tom Hunt, uh, Yamcourt, Northfield Farm. Um, and thanks to all you watching. And we had so many great comments coming in. I really feel people have uh, enjoyed it as exactly the positive balanced discussion yeah. we were hoping yeah, for. No, uh, thank you also. Um, I see some of them are already asking for round two. And I'm afraid um, I have no notes. <laughs> I'm always happy to Hold talk about these things. Yeah. We, Jan, we could always chat on, on Instagram. Are you on Instagram? Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, after a fashion. But no, I'd we love could always to... carry the conversation on there at some point and do well, a live conversation. You need to come up here, definitely. Yeah. Come, yeah, yeah. Come, come to the farm, come see what's happening. And, and ditto with you, uh, Angela. Yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, that is it for Junesboro Talks. Back in July, where I will be talking to Honey & Co, Lovely Street and Itamar. Um, that's going to be very different from this and uh, equally fun and interesting, I'm sure. Um, so hopefully I'll see lots of you then. But for now, um, thank you and farewell from uh, Borough Markets Borough Talks. Thank you so much. Bye.